Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here for Honors Bio video 10-1. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the body systems that we're going to look at during quarter four. I'll also talk to you about the concept of homeostasis, give some examples of disruptions to homeostasis, and then also an example of how the body will maintain homeostasis in one specific example. I will then talk to you guys about three of the body systems and introduce them a little bit. Those will be the skeletal, the muscle, and the integumentary system. All right, so here we go. So in this slide here, I'm going to go through really quickly all the different body systems that we're going to talk about during quarter four. In the upper left here, we got the integumentary system, and that's going to be the skin, hair, and nails. And then next we have the skeletal system. Those are two that we'll talk about a great more depth later on in this video. Then we have the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system is going to return fluids to the blood. It's also going to defend against pathogens. It's an interesting overlap between the circulatory system and the immune system. It's really an interface between those two systems. The respiratory system is going to involve uh, the lungs, and it's going to be about gas exchange, bringing in oxygen and removing carbon dioxide from the body. In the middle row, we start with the muscle system. Here, this image is going to show mostly skeletal muscles, but we'll talk about other types of muscles involved with movement within the body, as well as the movement of the body as a whole. Next up, we have the nervous system. This is going to receive stimuli, both external to the body and internal. It's going to process that information, and it's going to respond to that information. Next, we have the digestive system. This is going to break down food material down into macromolecules and then ultimately down into the subunits of those macromolecules, get them into the bloodstream. The urinary system is part of the excretory system. Specifically, we're looking at the kidneys here and how they deal with nitrogenous waste. Lower left-hand corner, last row, we look at the endocrine system. This is going to receive signals, produce hormones, release those hormones into the circulatory system and then target other cells in the body for responding to, to those hormones. Next, we have the cardiovascular system, and this is the arteries, veins, along with the heart and the capillaries that are going to move materials throughout the human body. Last two images are reproductive systems of the male and the female. These are going to produce gametes. They are going to be designed to get those gametes to fuse together. And then once those gametes fuse with inside the female reproductive system, the zygote will develop into an embryo, then a fetus. The fetus will be nourished until birth. And those are the body systems. We'll be talking about those throughout the quarter. In the lower right-hand corner, we see the word homeostasis. So what is this word homeostasis? Homeostasis means maintaining a relatively stable state. So this means that all these body systems are going to work to try and keep your body at a pretty even kill. So one example of this could be body temperature. Your body wants to stay at 37 degrees Celsius and 37 degrees Celsius is the optimal temperature for most of your enzymatic activities. So we know that if you have something go on and your body is getting too cold, body systems will work in order to raise the temperature back up to 37 degrees Celsius. We'll talk about this specific mechanism a little bit later on in this video, but that would be a good example of the fact that you want to have a stable state, a set temperature, and that if you're not in that stable state, your body will work in order to get you back to that state. But there are some things, aside from just you know being in a cold room or being in too hot of a room, that are actually profound disruptions to homeostasis. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause and think. And what are some factors that could more significantly disrupt homeostasis in a body system? Why don't you pause and think? All right, so this is a pretty broad question. So there's a lot of different directions you could have gone with this. You could have been thinking, all right, uh, respiratory system, how is my respiratory system disrupted and gone down that pathway? Or you could have been thinking very broadly, what are things that make human bodies not function properly? So here's my list of possible things that could disrupt homeostasis. One is trauma. So let's say you're in a car crash. Well, car, you in a car crash, you break your leg. Now the leg, which is going to have have skeletal and it's going to have muscle function working together and it's going to allow you to move and provide support. Well, now if you have a broken bone in your leg, your movement is going to be impaired. You're going to lose that homeostatic ability to move the muscles the way you'd like and to move properly. Uh, you may lose some other functions as well, but that would be one example. Environmental influence. Let's say you go out during spring break and you spend way too much time in the sun and you get a sunburn. 
and that sunburn now leads to your skin being inflamed. That inflammation leads to the fact that your body is not able to use your skin to regulate body temperature the way you normally do because of your skin being disrupted or inflamed. Sort of along the same lines, let's say you got into a patch of poison ivy over spring break, now you get a rash from something that you were exposed to in the environment. Similarly, that rash on your skin would lead to a loss of function. You wouldn't necessarily be able to regulate your body temperature the same way you normally do because of that poison ivy. Next up, I have genetic variation. I'm going to go sort of very specific here. And one example could be if you had a genetic mutation for something that's a genetic disease, something like the CFTR mutation that leads to cystic fibrosis. The CFTR protein is involved with production of mucus. If you can't produce normal mucus, your respiratory system becomes dramatically impaired. As a result of this genetic mutation, you now have a respiratory imbalance. Parasites and viruses, you get the flu, your lungs become inflamed. And so now as a result of that inflammation that you get in your lungs, you now are not going to have proper respiratory function. Similarly, you have a parasite. Let's say a mosquito lands on you, bites you, get, you get malaria, obviously not around here, but malaria will lead to disruption of red blood cells. It will also lead to disruption of the liver and the loss of the function of those structures will lead to symptoms and disease and a loss of homeostasis. The last thing I have here is design compromises. And this one takes a little bit of creative thinking, I think, but you have to think about the fact that we as humans are chordates and most chordates are tetrapods. So in fact, we are a tetrapod. What does that mean? It means most organisms in our group walked on four limbs and our spine would run parallel to the ground. But we are going to walk upright. We actually have grasping hands and we walk as a bipedal organism. And with those grasping hands, sometimes we grasp a little too much weight than we should have been carrying. And as a result, we will hurt our backs. So it's pretty easy to say that, well, because of the ability for our arms to grab things and us to carry things, we are now put into a position where we can put extra, extra strain on our backs because of the design compromises and the evolutionary legacies of us being tetrapods that have this special ability. So these are some of the ways that you can disrupt homeostasis. Let's get into a couple of the specific systems. Let's start by looking at the skeletal system. So we have both skeletal and muscle in here. I'm going to come back to the muscle. Let's talk about the skeletal system. So when we talk about the skeletal system, we're talking about certain structures. So bones, obviously, I think you guys all know what bones are. We have about 206 bones in the average human adult. They would include things like the upper arm bone of humerus, the upper leg bone of the femur. We could go through and go and name through all the bones. You're not mandated to learn all the names of all the bones. Cartilage is found at the interface of bone to bone. So if you think of the padding that is on the end of the knees, also you have little uh, strips of tissue that's very like cartilage that will help connect a bone with bone in those same interfaces. And those are ligaments. And so, for example, most people have heard of the ligaments in the knee because of sports injuries, things like the ACL or the MCL. These these are strips of connective tissue that are going to connect the bones together. It's going to connect bone to bone. These are not going to be vascular, meaning they're not going to have blood flowing through them. And as a result, they have very limited ability to repair themselves. If you tear your ACL, they have to go in and either put a ligament from a different part of your body or from a cadaver in order to replace that. Tendons are actually going to connect the skeleton to the bone, and these are going to have vascular connections because the muscles are going to have uh, blood vessels that are going to flow to them, and so the tendons are going to connect muscle with bone. So when we look at how these work, there are actually six functions that are associated with the skeletal system. Those are to provide support, and so that helps you stand upright. They are going to allow for movement, and that is, again, connecting those muscles to bones. They're going to involve protection. So protection is going to be things like your skull protecting your brain, rib cage protecting your heart and internal organs. They're also going to be, if we look at this lower left-hand diagram, see that you have compact bone, and inside that compact bone, you're going to store minerals like calcium. And then inside the space, inside these long bones, you are going to see that there are um, two types of marrow. One is called yellow marrow, and that's going to be involved in storage of fats. And then another type, which is called red marrow, and this is going to be where blood cells are made. And so you should be able to recognize that blood cells are made inside these long bones, and that's one of our key functions of the skeletal system. So white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets all are manufactured within these long bones in this in these cavities where we find both red marrow and yellow marrow. Also, some of the flat bones like your pelvis uh, will also have some red marrow found inside as well. 
All right, so now let's talk about the muscle. And this actually has all the different tissue types of the body shown in this diagram, but I'm gonna focus up here on this grouping here, which has the skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscles. So let's talk about them one at a time, the skeletal muscles. These are voluntary muscles. These are gonna be muscles that your body is going to move consciously. So you wanna pick something up, you wanna grab something, you're moving the biceps, your triceps. These are the things that when I asked you what your muscles are, if I was to ask you that in class, you would all probably pick things like your biceps, your triceps, your quadriceps, the large muscles that connect to your skeleton that you consciously move. These are your skeletal muscles. The next type of muscle is called a smooth muscle, and these are involuntary muscles, and these are found inside of organs. The biggest place I find these are going to be in the lining of your digestive tract. So if you think about it, you chew some food up and you swallow it, moves down your esophagus. When it moves down your esophagus, you're not thinking, move the food down your esophagus, move the food down your esophagus. Well, maybe you are, but if you are, you're just crazy. You don't control that. Don't think about how to move the food through your body because those muscles don't respond to those signals. The smooth muscle is going to be this flat, spindle-shaped cell and they're going to basically line all the tubes of your body. That would mean your esophagus, your stomach, your intestines. It will also apply to your blood vessels. They're all going to be lined with smooth muscles. Your diaphragm, which is runs underneath your lungs that controls the um, inhalation, exhalation. This is also a form of smooth muscle. And the last type we're going to talk about is a cardiac. And the cardiac is interesting because it's involuntary like the smooth muscle, but structurally it's going to look very similar to the skeletal muscle. It's going to be striated, meaning it's going to have bands of light and dark muscle fiber, and it's going to contract in a way that's very similar to that of skeletal muscle. It does have a few structural differences. They're multinucleated. They also are going to have some branching structures to them, but they're generally speaking, the cardiac muscles look more like skeletal muscles, but are under unconscious control. Similar to deciding to, that you're going to control the way the food moves through your esophagus, you can't control your heart beating. If you're thinking beat, 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 that's not how the heart beats. The heart beat is controlled by involuntary regulation. All right, so this leads us to our third and final system we're going to talk about in this video, and that is the integumentary system. And the integumentary system is your skin and also includes your hair and nails, but we're going to focus really in on skin for this. And we're going to talk about how the skin has four real main functions here. It's going to retain body fluids. It's going to be a waterproof barrier from the outside. It's also going to help keep your body fluids inside your body. It's this barrier, as I was talking about. As part of that barrier, it's also going to protect against diseases. If you think about it, the world is filled with bacteria. You are walking around and you're full of all of these very nutritious macromolecules that bacteria and fungi and parasites would love to consume, but your skin provides a separation from your internal environment to your external environment. As a result, it protects you from many diseases. It's going to also be involved with eliminating wastes when you sweat. So you can see a sweat gland down here. The sweat gland will be associated with secreting certain salts and water. And then the last thing we have is regulating body temperature. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute, but it's also connected to those sweat glands. When I look at the layers of the skin, we see that there's an outer layer the epidermis. The epidermis is really going to be a waterproof layer of mostly dead skin cells on the top. And then we have this layer underneath it. In that layer, as part of that protection, I could also say protection of UV rays kind of fits into that general protection model. We will have cells called melanocytes that will be inside this layer, and they are going to help protect us against ultraviolet radiation. We have this dermal layer where you're going to see a lot of blood vessels in here. We see our hair follicles. We see oil glands. And the lower area, is, which is called fatty tissue in this diagram, it's also sometimes called hypodermis. This is going to be a subcutaneous layer of fat that represents that third layer of skin. All right, so let's talk about how the body regulates temperature. And this is actually going to be a callback to our earlier slide where we talked about homeostasis. So we have our normal stable state. That's our 37 degrees Celsius. That's right in the middle here, or 98.6 Fahrenheit, if you prefer. Let's say you go into a very cold room. And in that very cold room, your body is going to sense that it is a low temperature. You're going to send a signal to your brain. And inside your brain, there's the hypothalamus. This is actually a both nervous and an endocrine structure. And what that's going to do is it's going to lead to the release of a signal that's going to do a few different things. One, it's going to send a signal to your arteries and it's going to cause them to constrict. As a result of them constricting, that's going to prevent less blood flowing through there and all, therefore less heat is going to dissipate out of your blood vessels. It's also going to cause you to increase your aerobic respiration and as a result, your muscles are going to shiver a little bit. 
It lastly is going to send a signal to your thyroid, again, another one of these endocrine glands, and that's going to increase your metabolic activity and you're going to produce some heat because of increased metabolic activity. The combination of these factors will lead to the body temperature increasing and hopefully you returning back to that 37. Again, if your body temperature is low, you're going to need to return it by raising body temperature. Now, let's say you go into a very warm room or you go outside on a hot day and the body temperature goes above that comfortable 37 degrees. Again, the hypothalamus is going to recognize that and it's going to send signals. So where are those signals going to go? Well, one is actually going to cause you to dilate your arteries. Those are going to lead you to more heat dissipating out of arteries and capillaries. It's also going to send a signal to your sweat glands and those sweat glands are going to then lead to sweat. Sweat will go out on the the surface of your skin, you're now going to have water that will evaporate off your skin and lead to evaporative cooling, leading to your skin getting cooled down. And lastly, it'll send a signal to your thyroid to cause you to decrease your metabolism. As a result, you won't be producing as much heat from metabolism, and this will also have a cooling mechanism. These three will help decrease body temperature and return you back to your homeostatic body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. So this is a good example of combining both our concept of homeostasis that we saw earlier and how organs work to do that with one of the specific systems that we've discussed in this video. I hope that was helpful for everybody, and I will talk to you all soon.